the pictures on the television news in the last couple of nights have been horrific, haven't they, with those fires? And, um, and last night's news there was supposedly 150 homes destroyed in New South Wales. At least three dead. I don't know if there's been any updates on that uh, since then. But um, those people need our prayers. Those people have lost so much. Um, those who have lost their lives, those families, they need comforting. I was thinking as, as whoever it was, was it you who was praying before, I was thinking while you were praying that we in this church, we're Christians, we know the comfort of God. There's many, many people out there who do not know that comfort. And right now, they're feeling very sad, which is normal. But they don't have any, anything to hang their hope on. The world won't give them anything to hang their hope on. Only God can do that. So we need to continually lift them up in prayer. And I just want to throw out to you people now, I'm sure there's others here who would want to pray for some of those people, pray for those who have lost so much, so, so much. And, and really, it's not just the, um, the homes, but probably livelihoods have been lost too, with the burning of all of the land. Um, it's it's a, a horrific thing, and it's not only in Australia either. We've seen a, a, a film of it in, in California. The, the world is in turmoil, friends. It really is. There's flooding, there's drought, there's fire, you name it, and it's somewhere, happening somewhere, all the time. The world is in turmoil. It really is. So, Father, as we gather together here, Lord, as believers, Believers in you, knowing that, Lord, you are the God who brings comfort. You are the God who touches our hearts, touches our spirits, lifts us up in times of trouble, encourages us, Father, uh, shows us your ways, Father. We, we are blessed to have that. But, Father, there's many, many, many people out there in the world who do not know that. Father, they may even be seeking for it, they may not be seeking for it. But Lord, you are the God of the impossible, Father. We ask that, Lord, you convict them, Lord, of their sin and their need for a Saviour. That, Lord, they may reach out to you and know your comfort in times like this. I pray for those families who have lost loved ones. That, Lord, even in this time of, of Lord, just grief, that, Father, you would reveal yourself to them in wonderful ways. Father, bring Bring your servants across their paths to be able to tell them the way, the truth, and the life, which is through Jesus Christ. Father, please, Lord, do wonderful things in this. Father, there is nothing impossible for you. And Lord, while we see these situations, we look at the impossibilities that are re rearing up out of them, <laughs> that's nothing for you, Lord. You can move in all of that. You can do wonderful things out of it all. So, Father, please, Lord, Work in each and every situation and every life that's been touched, I pray, in Jesus' name. And Father, we pray for rain, too, across this drought-ravaged land. Father, we, Lord, we not only want the physical, but we want the spiritual, Father. We want it all, Father. We're greedy. We want the rain. We want the, the, the latter rain. We want everything, Lord, from your hand, Father. So, Lord, I ask that, Father, you just give this dry and thirsty land a drink, a good, solid drenching, Lord. But Father, people who depend on the land for their for their livelihood, Father, for their bread, every necessity of life, and Father, they would be blessed by the out, outpouring of the rain across this dry land. Father, we lift our country before you. Father, Lord, we know that Father is far from a country that worships you, really. Father, as a, as a whole, this country has voted for same-sex marriage, Father. We see all sorts of ugly things raising their heads all the time, Father. Do not, they're from the pit of hell. They're not from you. They're not bringing you glory. And Father, please, in Jesus' name, touch lives in this country. Turn this country around, Lord. Oh, Father, Lord, this country was claimed long, long ago, Father. Is the great south land of the Holy Spirit. We want to see that brought to pass, Lord. Let your Holy Spirit reign supreme in this land. Do what you have to do, Lord. In Jesus' precious name. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, bless you, bless you. 
Has anybody else got a prayer point they need to pray? Tell me. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just want to reflect Colleen's prayer. And Lord, everyone that's in turmoil in this in this world today, we just ask for your love, your power to pour upon them. Lord, that they may know you. Those that don't know you may may turn and see that there is a God, and they can turn to you and be comforted. Just ask for comfort for these people. For those in the fires, Lord, bring them your comfort. And Lord, yes, we we do ask for the outpouring of your rain on this land, on this dry and thirsty land, but the outpouring of your Holy Spirit's rain too that your love, your power may be shown to every person in this land. Thank you, Jesus. Let's gather around the word. Father, as I bring this word that you give me today, I pray, Lord, for open and receptive hearts. And Father, we will, all of us, Father, myself included, will take to heart the things that you give me out of your word. Father, your word is so precious. Your, your word, Father, your word is supernatural. Father, it brings life, it brings healing, it brings, it brings everything. So, Father, as we share around your word today, bless this time to us, I pray, in Jesus' precious name. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Okay. If you'd like to put that title slide up, it says, title of my message, Peter Says. Peter Says. If my, memory, if my memory serves me correctly, doesn't always do that, mind you, there used to be a game that children played called Simon Says. Anybody remember that? Okay, all oh, right, obviously. That, oh, I surprise myself sometimes. Whatever Simon said or did had to be copied or mimicked by others, didn't it? This is not a message about what Simon says, but it's a rather doing what the Apostle Peter says. Peter says, Peter says, okay? I've always had a soft spot for Peter, his impetuous nature, his habit of speaking out when he should have perhaps kept silent. I love the fact that the Bible story does not gloss over his failings, but it reveals his weaknesses and his eventual strengths. I think he is a picture of many people today, myself included. I guess that's why I empathise with him so much. I wasn't going to... Uh, I wasn't going to, um, I haven't put this in, but it keeps coming back to me. Many, many years ago, I was preparing a message uh, from the book, of one of the letters of Peter, and I got this vision of this very, very old man with long grey beard. It was not purely white, it was slightly grey. Long grey cloak, I suppose you'd call it, down to the ground. And I'm the picture I got, and I assume it was the catacombs of Rome, the underground areas under Rome, the, 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 the rough-hewn rock walls, or more clay, more clay than rock, I suppose. There was a long table with a candle on it, and I saw this old man, um, very serious, very studious looking, walking across and sitting down with parchment to write what he'd learnt over the years. Very, very real. <laughs> Even now it is. Yeah, thank you Lord. But I think that was Peter. I think it was Peter. Peter had a habit of suffering from foot and mouth disease. He denied the Lord Jesus three times, even though Jesus warned him that he would do that. He promised to follow Jesus through thick and thin. When the crunch came, he failed badly. His life was turned completely around after he met the risen Jesus. And all the teachings that he'd heard from Jesus over the previous three and a half years, they all clicked together for him. And 50 days after denying he knew Jesus, he preached the first sermon recorded in the Bible and thousands were converted. He became the epitome of being a new creation in Christ. We can see from his letters just how much he had changed from what he had been like originally. Think back over your own lives. 
what are you like now compared to what you were like years, many years ago? For some of us, more, more years than we care to remember, I know. We have all changed, haven't we? Very much so. His first letter was written to comfort Jewish Christians who were experiencing persecution for their faith and to challenge them to continue living holy lives. Then about three years later, he wrote his second letter to the same people to teach them about handling heresy. False teachers were spreading their doctrines just like they do today and it's rife today. Peter warned Peter wanted to equip them to be able to recognize and stand against their teaching. So we're going to read part of his second letter to them, starting from 2 Peter 1, verses 3 to 11. 2 Peter 1, 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge of self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. So therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So before we go back and open up those verses, I just want to look at verses 12 and 13 for a moment. I, so I will always remind you of these things. Even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have, I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body. Friends, those words apply to us just as much today. We often need to be reminded about things, don't we? We think we know them, but we've let them slip into the background of our lives because of the pressures of life of everyday living. But Peter reminded his readers of what they'd been taught. He knew through the leading of the Holy Spirit that they needed a, refresh, a refreshing course. A refresher course. So look at this message as a, as a refresher course from Peter. Peter says, so let's begin with verses 3 and 4. 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these He has given us His very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. His divine power is, of course, God's divine power. There is no other power that can match His power in magnitude. It is infinite, meaning there's no end to it. That's God's power. I don't know about you. My finite mind cannot possibly grasp how great that divine power is. We can talk about it, but really, how much of it do we really grasp? We acknowledge His greatness. But really, it is impossible to imagine the vastness of His power. We can have a, an inkling about His greatness when we acknowledge He is the creator of the heavens and the earth and all that are seen in them. But words cannot begin to describe even then just how great that is. It's beyond us. I think that when we get to be with Him in heaven, we'll have a much greater appreciation of His greatness because then we'll be able to see with new eyes. Um, Paul said that, that now we see through a glass of darkly, but then we'll have, we will, in fact, we will be face to face knowing in full. That's ahead of us yet. Knowing in full. I'm looking forward to that. 
You see, He's given us everything we need for life and godliness. That word, everything, is like the word all. David and I had a discussion about all a few weeks ago, didn't we? What does all mean? Everything. And everything means all. All. Nothing left out. It can only mean one thing. It can only mean what it says. You can't twist it into meaning anything else. Nothing is left out. Nothing more can be given. Nothing more has to be given. It has all been given. It's finished. How great is that? Man can't do anything to change it. It's done. Regardless of the fact that we cannot begin to explain His greatness, the little knowledge we have of Him is all He requires to impart to us everything we need for this life. He's given us all that we need now. He does it through His glory and His goodness. Think back for a moment to a struggling fisherman by the shores of a lake, washing his nets from the grime of the seashore and hearing the words, Follow me. That was Peter, just over 30 years before he wrote this. He knew the truth of the fact it was God who called him, not him seeking for something that he was not even aware of, but God actually called him. Does that fit with all of us? You know, we're only where we are because we answered the call of God in our lives. He sought us out, reached out for us. He does not want anyone to be lost. But not everyone answers his call. Praise God for each of you that you've answered his call. He's given us his wonderful promises so that we may participate in or partake of his divine nature. I'm going to read some beautiful words from a man called Alexander McLaren as he talks about this. Partakers of the divine nature. These are bold words and may be so understood as to excite the wildest and most presumptuous dreams. But bold as they are, and startling as they may sound to some of us, they are only putting into another language the teaching of which the whole Testament, New Testament is full. That men may and do by their faith receive into their spirits a real communication of the life of God. What else does the language about being the sons and the daughters of the Lord Almighty mean? What else does the teaching of regeneration mean? What else means what else mean Christ's frequent declarations that He dwells in us and we in Him, as the branch and the vine, as the members in the body? What else? He that is joined to the Lord in one spirit. What else does he that is joined to the Lord in one spirit mean? Do not all teach that in some most real sense the very purpose of Christianity for which God has sent His Son and His Son has come is that we, poor, sinful, weak, limited, ignorant creatures as we are may be lifted up into that solemn and awful elevation and receive in our trembling and yet strengthened souls a spark of God. That ye may be partakers of the divine nature means more than to that you may share in the blessings which that nature bestows. It means, listen, it means that into us may come the very God Himself. That's partaking of that divine nature. God in us, the Holy Spirit dwelling in each and every one of us. Isn't that beautiful? How wonderful it is. God Himself comes to each and every one of us. How we need that in this fallen world where corruption and violence and ungodly behaviour is increasing more and more every day. God has given us all we need. Now, what do we have to do? Peter says in verse 5, For this very reason, because of all that's gone before, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. God has laid the foundation in us and given us the Holy Spirit, God Himself, to live in each of us. We cannot just now sit back and think we have it all. We have to do something. We have to grow. 
we have to do something in this in his first letter Peter's encouraging, Peter's encouraging us to grow in the Lord just look at 1 Peter 2 2 and 3 for a start like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good he says we have to grow up we can't stay static He's talking to people who are saved, but he's encouraging us not to be static, not to stand still in our faith. We are to grow up in our salvation. Remember the scripture in Philippians 2 verse 12 and 13. Therefore, my dear, friend, dear friends, as you have always, always obeyed, not only in my presence, this is Paul talking, but now, much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You see, God's done his part. Now we have to do our part if we want to grow in him. The thing is, he's not just done all that was needed, but He now helps us as we seek to grow in Him. He's still there. We are to make the effort to add it to our faith, to grow into all that His divine nature has for us. So Peter says, we start by adding goodness. But before we look at what he means by goodness, let's look at that little word, add. That little word, add, in the original Greek, it sounds something like epikoriego. Epikoreidio, and it means to fully supply. It was used of patrons of the arts, people who supported drama and entertainment. And these patrons supplied all that was needed and more to ensure the production of outstanding plays and all types of entertainment. They outdid each other in supplying the needs of every production. And Peter's saying now, not to just seek to add a touch of goodness and knowledge and so on, but to be unstinting in seeking all these qualities out. Unstinting. Don't stop. We are to be unstinting in seeking out all we can get of all of them. And of course, each one is not just one off experience, but a one off experience. We continue to grow in each and every one of them. Each one is continual growth. We never stop seeking to grow in each and every characteristic. So now, let's get back to goodness. It refers to moral excellence, but more than that, it refers to the energy or vigorous action of displaying that excellence. We can't just hold it in, it has to be outworked also. Being a Christian should mean more than just being saved, it should mean displaying our faith in our actions, in our lifestyles, in our languages, in our behaviours. What would we be like if after conversion, we stayed the same as we were with all of our bad language and bad habits and worldly attitudes. Now I think the adding of moral excellence and the outworking of that is something that should be a continual growth factor for all of us. Would you agree with that? It's something we have to continually grow in. Because the world out there looking at us and waiting to see what we will do and how we react and so on. And we have to react out of what God has given us, what He's put in us. So adding goodness never stops. But as we grow in goodness, Peter says, we add to that knowledge. Knowledge of what? We already know of God, we know of His Son, because we've been saved through our faith in Him. We don't need the knowledge of the world other than to be aware of the ways of the worldly system, which is the domain of Satan. The word knowledge includes the, the thought of wisdom. Wisdom to be able to properly ascertain the will of God as we learn more and more and more of Him. Knowledge is useless without wisdom to be able to use that knowledge properly. We need the two to go together. Our study of the Word of God will give us both knowledge and the wisdom to be able to use that knowledge properly. <clears throat> knowledge of God and His ways are good. But to be able to exhibit the moral excellence that Peter began with, we need the wisdom to be able to show that excellence in ways that will just suit the situations we might find ourselves in. Wisdom grows along with knowledge as we study His Word and apply it to our lives, step by step by step. 
So the next step, Peter says, to add without measure is self-control. The meaning is to rule with a strong hand. Self-control is listed as one of the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5.23. Starting in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Paul had just listed some of the acts of the sinful nature in the verses before this. And then shows what a life lived for God looks like. Totally different. I think Peter hit the, hit the nail on the head when he said we are, we are to add self-control unstintingly. Self-control is something that is missing more and more in this ungodly world we live in. And you must agree with that. You see it in the news all the time. You just continually see examples of no self-control shown in many, many lives. The violence, the reactions, the everything. So we have to have mastery over all evil inclinations, thoughts and desires. We are not to allow such things to control us, but we are to control them. The beauty of it is that we have the help of the Holy Spirit in this area, don't we? God knew how hard it would be for some to have self-control. So He included it in the gifts imparted to us through the Holy Spirit in us. That does not mean that we sometimes don't have a little battle against some particular thing, because we do, don't we? We've got to be honest. But with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can, and we do, overcome. So what do we do? add uns unstintingly to self-control? Peter says, add perseverance. Some translations use the word steadfastness or the word patience for perseverance. They all mean the same thing. One commentator puts it this way. Bearing all trials and difficulties with an even mind, enduring in all and persevering through all. How necessary is patience or enduring to the end. James attaches great importance to perseverance. James 1 verse 4. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Listen to how the Amplified Bible puts it. This is, I love this verse in, in the Amplified. But let endurance and steadfastness and patience have full play and do a thorough work so that you may be people perfectly and fully developed with no defects, lacking in nothing that we may be people perfectly and fully developed with no defects, lacking in nothing. That's a pretty powerful statement. Look at those results. Perfect. Perfectly and fully developed. No defects. Lacking in nothing. That's what comes out of patience, perseverance, all those things. I get the idea that as we learn to grow in patience and perseverance, the Holy Spirit in us brings great changes in us without us even realising it. You know, we do become different people and we cannot see the, the gradual change until we look back and realise where we've come from, like I said before. We do become different people. It happens as we endure the challenges of life, not giving into temptations, not letting, not letting our will take over, but we operate our soul. So as we learn patience and endurance, Peter says, we add godliness. Adam Clark describes godliness this way. Piety towards God, a deep reverential religious fear. Not only worshipping God with every becoming outward act, but adoring, loving and magnifying Him in the heart. A disposition indispensably necessary to salvation, but exceedingly rare among professors, those who acknowledge Him. That's a hard thing, isn't it? But I think it's quite true. You see, true godliness is more than just spending an hour or two each week in church. True godliness is a whole of life, 24-7 experience. Everything we do, everything we say, all of our relationships, all of our attitudes, they must all be put under that desire to truly put God first place in our lives. He's got to be up here. Nothing of us above Him. 
We cannot be perfect if we, want, if we have one foot in the world and one foot in God's ways. If we are to be perfectly and fully developed and lacking in nothing, like we read in that Amplified Translation for endurance, then our walk with God has to grow in godliness. There is no other way to seek to grow in this area but to draw near to Him. I love the atmosphere this morning as we were singing those, those songs. They were beautiful words. and To me, that, that really... I, I really felt drawn to closer to God through those, through those songs. It was beautiful. But that should be a 24-7 thing for us. So later on in this letter, Peter, Peter tells us to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. In other words, becoming more like Him. As we become more like Him, we reflect His character to others around us. And that's the reflection of godliness that others will see. Peter had come from being a fisherman to, to, to a disciple who failed, to a man of God who had experienced all that God had for him. And this is his secret of how he did it. He's talking, speaking out of his own life experience. So to godliness, what does Peter say that we add? Let's look at verse 7. And to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. So what is brotherly kindness? How do we show that? In his very first letter, Peter mentions the same thing in 1 Peter 1.22. Now, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. Brotherly kindness and love go together. We cannot have brotherly kindness without God's love in our hearts. It may not be easy to love some people. God commands us to love one another. It's a command. There are some people we may not like. But regardless of that, we are to love them. God loved us and all mankind enough that He sent His Son to die on a cross and take, all, take away all the sin of those who would call on Him. He did not wait until we were good enough to love, but He loved us even though we were sinners. He set the example. <clears throat> the same love is asked of us that we love one another the expression of that love to others is through brotherly kindness brotherly kindness is not to be restricted to those who are our brothers and sisters in the Lord out of our growth in godliness we are able to show that kindness to those who are, uh, who are as yet unbelievers the greatest way of showing brotherly kindness to unbelievers even though we may not like them is to pray for them. Pray for their salvation. But be prepared that God may ask you to witness to them just the same. Brotherly kindness and love are linked together. I don't believe we can have that kindness without that love in us. They go hand in hand. Remember the love chapter in Corinthians? Remember, remember verse 13, 13 of 1 Corinthians? And now these three remain. Faith, hope and love. But the greatest of these is love. Love overall. Overall. Everything flows out of love. If we work back from love, we can see that all the other attributes flow out of love. You know, we can try our hardest to develop all of these attributes. Friends, we can't do it in our own strength. Unless you're different to me. They all flow out of love, love for God and for each other, wanting the best for ourselves and for each other. We have to have the love of God expressed through the working of the Holy Spirit to be able to even begin to add these character building traits to our lives. Look at the results of building up these attributes in our lives in verse 8. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's beautiful. We will not be ineffective, we will not be unproductive before the Lord if we grow in all of these measures. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty good to me. I like the thought of that. I want to be effective for God. I want to be productive for God. Not just in my life, but in seeing others build up their lives so that they too will be effective and productive. 
and that's what it's all about. And I, I, in our healing rooms at Caborcha, I love it when, when our ministers learn something new or grow, take another step and, and grow more and more and more. It's beautiful to see. But to feel, fulfill that in my life, I have to add to all these attributes, not leaving any behind. Always seeking to add to my life goodness, and knowledge, and self control, and perseverance, and godliness, and brotherly kindness, and over all of these, love. Does that mean I've got it all together? No way. No way. But I do trust that I'm a little bit better now than what I was a long time ago. So, what about? each of us today, you and I. I know I've been talking to myself, but have these words resonated with anyone here? Has the Holy Spirit whispered to you that there are some little things that you need to look at? Have you been reminded of things that you've forgotten, maybe? Like we said at the beginning, Peter said, it's good to remind ourselves of these things. You know, don't hear condemnation if the Holy Spirit touches upon something in your life. Rather see it as His desire that you may be whole and effective and productive. Productive for God. Productive in God. You see, He wants the very best for each of us. For you and I. That's His way. Because He loves us so much. He does. We'll close the service um, if anyone would like prayer, please don't hesitate to come out here. We'll join together before God in the presence of the Holy Spirit to bring our needs before His throne. I thank you for your attentiveness for sitting here and listening to the drone of my voice. Like I said, I love reading Peter because he reminds me of, I always, I always remember where he came from and where he ended up. I want to be like that. I want to be a person who leaves all the old way behind and continues to grow, as he says, to add, to add, to add, to get where God really wants me to be. Father, thank you for your word. I do pray that, Lord, you've, that, Lord, despite of my, my delivery, that you've used it to touch hearts. And that, Father, you've encouraged us. And, Father, you've done mighty things in hearts this day. Lord, we just uh, give ourselves afresh to you, saying, Lord, here we are, Father. Come, continue to dwell in us and take us on to all you have for us. Continue, Father, for... Uh, Continue to take hold of us and help us, Father, to add all of these attributes to our characters. Not just to add a little bit here and there, but to add unstintingly, to seek to be the best in all of these things. For, Lord, it's for your glory. It's all for your glory, because we can't do it without you. So, Father, thank you. Please take us on. May we have a great week, Father, in whatever you, uh, comes across our paths this week. Lord. Keep us safe, whatever we do. May we be excellent witnesses for you, Lord, in those that we meet with, those that we talk with, rather even in the supermarkets and our, markets and our shopping, whatever. May, Lord, may Jesus be seen in us. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, folks.